Hey, Reading 9 students. So this is Mrs. Zimmerman recording the audio for the open window for you guys. I told you guys that I was going to find a version that someone else had recorded online, but I couldn't quite find something that I liked. So I decided to just go ahead and record my own version. So we are going to be reading The Open Window by Saki, and you can kind of follow along as um, on the page here, or if you have your book open to 817, I have it next to me right here as well, um, you can follow along on that as well. So let's talk about a few basics of the story before we get into reading the story. So this story takes place um, back around, I want to say, the 1800s. And around that time, uh, there was a really big class division. So if you were really, really rich, you often um, really didn't have to work that much. You just kind of inherited your wealth versus the very, very poor who had to work all the time. And this takes place in around the 1800s, and it's British upper class. So think of like the snobbiest, most British, like pinky ring up while they're drinking tea kind of attitude. Really snobbish, and they think they're better than everyone else. So we follow a Mr. Natel. You can see that on the page here. He's our main character, and he is a very nervous man. He's very, very nervous, and they had this thing back in the day called the nerve cure, and it's kind of like it was for people with anxiety or with nerves and they couldn't really settle down. So what they would do is they'd take them out on a trip to the countryside, a very nice country setting where they could just relax and not have to worry about responsibilities. So that's what's happening with Mr. Natel. He is on a nerve cure trip. And along the way, well, when he, res when he goes to this house that he's going to be staying at for the nerve cure, he finds this woman, this young woman named Vera. And the way that they describe Vera is very self-possessed. So if we're looking on the side of this page here, it says self-possessed means composed or in control of your feelings or actions. So Vera is a very mature young woman. She's only 15, but she's very mature, very serious. No gossiping, no silliness at all. She's very mature. So that's who Vera is. Mr. Natel and Vera, they meet. Um, one last thing that I will talk about is that they used to have these very formal things called letters of introduction. And a letter of introduction was your way of introducing yourself to someone that you didn't know. So you, like today, you can really walk up to anyone that you want and introduce yourself. Versus back in the day, it was very, very against societal rules to go up and to someone and, and say hello. So they have a, um, a letter of introduction that is given to Mr. Natel by his sister, who does know this family. So Mr. Natel brings that letter of introduction along to give to the family. So I'm very excited to read this. Please make sure you are following along as we read. This is a story that has a little bit of weird language in it, but I'll try and stop every once in a while to recap what's going on. Um, and if you don't have headphones, you shouldn't be listening to this, to out, this out loud right now. Great. Okay. Here we go. I'll try to do the voices too. My aunt will be down presently, Mr. Nuttall, said a very self-possessed young lady of 15. In the meantime, you must try and put up with me. Frampton Natel endeavored to say the correct something which should duly flatter the niece of the moment without unduly discounting the aunt that was to come. Privately, he doubted more than ever whether these formal visits on a succession of total strangers would do much toward helping the nerve cure which he was supposed to be undergoing. I know how it will be, his sister had said when he was preparing to migrate to this rural retreat. You will bury yourself down there and not speak to a living soul, and your nerves will be worse than ever from moping. I shall just give you letters of introduction to all the people I know there. Some of them, as far as I can remember, were quite nice. 
Frampton wondered whether Mrs. Sappleton, the lady to whom he was presenting one of the letters of introduction, came into the nice division. Do you know many of the people around here? asked the niece when she judged that they had sufficient silent communion. Hardly a soul, said Frampton. My sister was staying here at the rectory, you know, for some four years ago, and she gave me letters of introduction to some of the people here. So already in this very first page, we're getting to know the characters a little bit better. Frampton is really nervous about going there. He doesn't think that the nerve cure is going to work. And then we have Vera, who's just being very nice and pleasant, and said she was self-possessed. We also are introduced to Mrs. Sappleton, and Mrs. Sappleton is Vera's mother. She's the woman of the house, you know, one of the heads, besides the father. All right, moving on. Oh, what a nice picture. He made the last statement in a tone of distinct regret. Then you know practically nothing about my aunt, pursued the self-possessed young lady. Only her name and address, admitted the caller. He was wondering whether Mrs. Sappleton was in the married or widowed state. An undefinable something about the room seemed to suggest masculine habitation. That means that something in the room suggested that a man lived there. Here, her great tragedy happened just three years ago, said the child. That would be since your sister's time. Her tragedy? asked Frampton. Somehow in this restful country spot, tragedies seemed out of place. You may wonder why we keep that window wide open on an October afternoon, said the niece, indicating a large French window that opened onto a lawn. It is quite warm for the time of year, said Frampton, but has that window got anything to do with the tragedy? Out through that window three years ago to a day, her husband and her two young brothers went off for their day's shooting. They never came back. In crossing the moor to their favorite snipe shooting ground, they were all three engulfed in a treacherous piece of bog. It had been that dreadful wet summer, you know, and places that were safe in other years gave way suddenly without warning. Their bodies were never recovered. That was the dreadful part of it. Here, the child's voice lost its self-possessed note and became falteringly human. Poor aunt always thinks that they will come back some day, and they and the little brown spaniel that was lost with them, and walk in that window just as they used to do. This is why the window is kept open every evening till it's quite dusk. Poor dear Anne, she has often told me how they went out, her husband with his white waterproof coat over his arm, and Ronnie, her youngest brother, singing, Birdie, why do you bound? As he always did to tease her, because she said it got on her nerves. Do you know, sometimes on still, quiet evenings like this, I almost get a creepy feeling that they will all walk in through that window. She broke off with a little shudder. It was a relief to Frampton when the aunt bustled into the room with a whirl of apologies for being late in making her appearance. So Vera has just given us a little bit of a story. And she says that three years ago, um, Mrs. Sappleton, her husband, so her husband, Mrs. Sappleton's husband and her couple of brothers went out hunting and they never came back. So they're presumed dead at this point. So Mrs. Sappleton comes bustling in the door. I hope Vera has been amusing you, she said. She has been very interesting, said Frampton. I hope you don't mind the open window, said Mrs. Sappleton bris briskly. My husband and brothers will be home directly from shooting, and they always come in this way. They've been out for snipe in the marshes today, so they'll make a fine mess over my poor carpets. So like you menfolk, isn't it? She rattled on cheerfully about the shooting and the scarcity of birds and the prospects for duck in the winter. To Frampton? It was all purely horrible. He made a desperate, but only partially successful effort to turn the talk onto a less ghastly topic. He was conscious that his hostess was giving him only a fragment of her attention, 
and her eyes were constantly straying past him to the open window and the lawn beyond. It was certainly an unfortunate coincidence that he should have paid his visit on this tragic anniversary. So at this point in the story, we see that Mrs. Sappleton isn't really listening to what's going on in the room. She's kind of busy staring off into the open window because she thinks that her husband's going to come back. But Vera has just told us that her husband is dead. So poor Mrs. Sappleton is kind of delusional at this point. She sounds kind of delusional. Let's read on. The doctors agree in ordering me complete rest, an absence of mental excitement, and avoidance of anything in the nature of violent physical exercise, announced Frampton, who labored under the tolerably widespread delusion that total strangers and chance acquaintances are hungry for the least detail of one's ailments and infirmities, their cause and cure. On the matter of diet, they are not so much in agreement, he continued. No, Mrs. Sappleton, in a voice which only replaced a yawn at the last moment. Then she suddenly brightened into alert attention. Sorry about the bell. Where were we at? Where were we at? Then she suddenly brightened into alert attention, but not to what Frampton was saying. Here they are at last, she cried, just in time for tea, and don't they look as if they were muddy up to the eyes. Frampton shivered slightly and turned toward the niece with a look intended to convey sympathetic comprehension. The child was staring, the child meaning Vera, was staring out through the open window with dazed horror in her eyes. In a chill shock of nameless fear, Frampton swung around in his seat and looked in the same direction. In the deepening twilight, Three figures were walking across the lawn toward the window. They all carried guns under their arms, and one of them was additionally burdened with a white coat hung over his shoulders. A tired brown spaniel kept close at their heels. Noiselessly, they, heard, they neared the house, and then a hoarse young voice chanted out of the dusk, I said, Bertie, why do you bound? Frampton wild, grabbed wildly at his stick and hat. The hall door, the gravel drive, and the front gate were dimly noted stages in his headlong retreat. A cyclist coming along the road had to run into the hedge to avoid imminent collision. So at that point, Frampton's running away, clearly terrified. Here we are, my dear, said the bearer of the white Macintosh, coming into the window. Fairly muddy, but most of it's dry. Who was that who bolted out as we came up? A most extraordinary man, a Mr. Nuttall, M Mr. Nuttall, said Mrs. Sappleton, could only talk about his illness. Sorry about the bell again. A most extraordinary man, a Mr. Nuttall, said Mrs. Sappleton, could only talk about his illnesses and dashed off without a word of goodbye or apology when you arrived. One would think he had seen a ghost. I expect it was the spaniel, said the niece calmly. He told me he had a horror of dogs. He was once hunted into a cemetery somewhere on the banks of the Ganges by a pack of pariah dogs and had to spend the night in a newly dug grave with the creatures snarling and grinning and foaming just above him, enough to make anyone lose their nerve. Romance, at short notice, was her specialty. All right, so I'm going to take a minute to debrief. So we had Mr. Nattel run away because all of a sudden he hears these guys coming in. He's freaked out. Um, so, so in the end, what has Vera done? It turns out she told Mr. Nattel a lie. She lied to him. And the way she kind of covers up for him running out is, you can see here, she, she claims that he was just afraid of dogs. But it turns out she was just playing a joke. And so the weird way they say that is it says romance at short notice was her specialty. Romance, it doesn't mean a love affair like they say over here. It refers to like coming up with a story 
or a, a mystery or a character or a plot or something like that. She's really good at coming up with stories and lies on the spot. So Vera just played a very good practical joke on Mr. Nattel.